explain like one of the most important price factors. And you guys understand it intuitively, but I'm gonna give you the example uh, Adam Smith gives. All right, so scarcity. This obviously is going to indicate what the price or value of something is. All right, so here, here's the example he uses. So as you guys know, the less of something there is, and if a lot of people want it, that's gonna dramatically increase the price. If there's a lot of it available, uh, it's not gonna be as expensive because it's easy to get. All right, so here's the example he uses. Um, you can tell me, which one of these things do you need to live? Diamonds uh, or water? I'm, I hope you can tell me. Water. Diamonds, yes, no, water. Um, water you like need to live, you'll die without it, right? Uh, so you would think that if every human on earth needs this to live every day for the most part, like you can go a couple, three days without water and then you'll die. But you pretty much need it every day. If you go a whole day without drinking water, you're just gonna be thirsty and focused on wanting to drink water or something else all, all day long, all right? So wouldn't you think that this would be more expensive because it's way more important to your survival? You would think so, right? But it's not, like you don't need this at all. Like, yeah, okay, you wanna show off that you, you, you're, you're wealthy or successful or, or, or whatever, but that's pretty much all diamonds are. Um, but what makes them so expensive? Because again, no one needs diamonds. I mean, you might need them for certain technologies now, but I mean, as far as you living or dying on a daily basis, you don't need diamonds. Why are diamonds so much more expensive than water? Oh, it's more than 10 times, but they're, they're substantially hard to get. They're incredibly rare and they're incredibly hard to get. So there's very few of them uh, as far as like uh, pounds of them, I guess you'd say, in the entire earth. And even where they are, they're not really accessible. You've got to like dig down deep in mines and get through a bunch of crap and it's really dangerous and expensive and hard to find them. So that's why they're so expensive, right? It's because even though I don't need this to live per se, uh, it is uh, far harder to get or find, and there's far less. And even though I need this to live every single day, because like these are thousands of dollars, well hundreds, but certainly thousands of dollars uh, if you have high quality ones or, 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 or a large one or whatever. Whereas water is just cents. It, it, it could be free technically. You could just go to the Lit River or lake or whatever and just grab some, right? You could dig a hole deep enough and it'll fill up with groundwater and you could use it. Like you'll have to do like go and get it. But it, you could just go walk out and get it. So the reason why water, even though we need it to live, is so cheap is because it's everywhere. You can go to the ocean, you can't drink it out of the ocean. You'd have to extract the salt out of it, but you can just go get it anywhere. Diamonds, on the other hand, I couldn't be like, unless you had the money to go buy them, I couldn't just be like, hey guys, go get some diamonds. You wouldn't be able to, right? I get you could have money and go buy them, but if you had to go find them on your own and extract them, none of you could do it. It, it wouldn't be possible. Uh, it would take you years to, uh, get a job or develop a machinery to go and find and then you'd have to get lucky and actually find them. All right, so that's why that scarcity is one of the most important price factors, right? And it's the exact same example I gave you guys with the, uh, with the lobster and the cod and other types of seafood. It used to be super cheap. They would give it to prisoners, but because uh, it's so rare now because it's been overfished, uh, it's much more expensive because there's far less of it to be found. All right, hopefully that makes sense. <clears throat> Speaking of which, let's start with page six, which is, uh, it's not as much writing as the other notes of the slides, if you don't want it to be. But it's more about learning how to uh, grasp these things, because that's one of the skills you have to have here. That's actually what you're gonna do for your own businesses. That's supposed to be six, not four. Oh, shorters and circles are So this notebook page is all about, uh, it's kind of introducing you guys to how to interpret uh, these graphs. And you're gonna have to be able to do that uh, as a skill for the actual um, uh, tests that we have, midterm, final, quizzes, uh, and then you'll see some of these things on like, uh, actually you guys already took your, uh, your state tests, but 
if you get SATs and ACTs later, uh, you, you're almost certainly going to have some sort of graphing question uh, regarding economics. So you got to know how to look at these things and know what they mean. So if we're trying to figure out as a business individually, because we're looking at microeconomics right now, so individual people or businesses, uh, if you're looking at what price to set, you can actually go find out before you even open up, uh, or at least have an idea of what price you should set. All right. So in a free market, who determines what my I get my sheets? I give you guys money. Uh, who determines what a price should be in a free market economy? In a command economy, obviously, a guild or the state or whoever the central authority determines that. But who in a free market economy determines that? Is it the people? Yeah, the people. So what do you mean by the people? Give me a couple terms. Um, a couple terms. A couple terms. I don't know. I just can explain it. Okay, take a shot at explaining um, it. If you sell your price, if you sell it for too high, nobody will buy it. If you sell it for too low, a lot of people will buy it. So cool. You so the you, you described it well. So if you sell it for too much, no one will uh, uh, buy it. If you sell it for too little, uh, you'll have a, a, a way too many people that are unhappy and that they didn't receive their good. So the terms I want to extract are what, do, what, what term would I use for the people who are selling and what term would I use for the people who are buying? I'm sticking with you. Oh, suppliers and um, consumers? Yeah, there you go. Suppliers and consumers. Or we can shorten it as uh, supply and demand. Okay. Right. That was what I was looking for. And you nailed it. All right. Cool. You're stealing all the money today. All right. So supply and demand determine my price. And there's other factors too, like competition and scarcity, et cetera. But um, another one's how much it costs to make this stuff. That's called cost of production. I think that's actually next week, so I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Uh, but I don't want to oversimplify it. So here's how I can figure it out. This is how all of your graphs are going to look. You're always going to make them like this or read them like this. This uh, y-axis, I think this is the y-axis and this is the x. Um, this y-axis is always going to be the price. So whatever price you're trying to figure out, uh, you're going to write them over here. So here's what you would do. Let's use uh, the t-shirt example again. All right, so t-shirts. What was my company's name? Like big shirts? Yeah. Big shirts with a Z, there we go. Big shirts. That's when the competition was huge shirts. But All right, so um, t-shirts. Obviously, I can't put a price lower, unless I'm stupid, I can't put a price lower than what it costs to make it. So it's gonna cost some money to make, like I need to get buy the cotton or polyester or whatever from a supplier. I need to pay somebody or some machines or pay for some machinery uh, to put them together. I gotta pay to have them bleached and have them colored and dyed and then distributed and I gotta mark it. So there's always gonna be a minimum price. All right, so let's say all those things put together, the materials, the labor, the transportation, and the advertising, for each shirt, I figure out it costs me a minimum of uh, $15. So I, I can't successfully charge anything less than 15. Uh, even 15, I just make nothing, right? Even if I sold them all. So I'm gonna have to have a higher 15. But nonetheless, we always start from zero here at the corner. So I would scale it like this. I'd go, all right, 10, uh, 20, 30, 40, 50, and you can go up to whatever you think you could get away with charging. All right, so let's say we stop it at 80 just to keep it simple. That's my price in dollars. That's always gonna be this y-axis, all right? And by the way, in some graphs, they're not actually gonna have the numbers, they'll just have price, and you're supposed to know that's where the money is. All right, on this uh, x-axis, that's always going to be uh, the quantity of shirts that I'm uh, either producing uh, or selling, all right? So, um, let's just say I'm a small business, so you probably can't make 100,000 shirts, um, but you could make maybe 1,000 shirts, all right? So let's say, let's scale it um, in hundreds then. So here's 100 shirts, here's 200 shirts, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700. But we'll stop at 800 just to keep it on the same graph, all right? Is it making sense so far? All right, so this is how many I could potentially produce or sell, and this is the prices I could sell them at. All right, so what you can do, generally speaking, as a supplier is uh, make a uh, supply curve, meaning all of the possible amounts I would be willing to produce if these uh, uh, prices were uh, uh, in effect, like I was selling them for this much. So generally, if you're going to make a supply curve, uh, you would uh, just kind of make a line like this, but I want to show you what that line means. I don't want to just draw it. 
So here's what it means. So let's say at $20 per shirt, right? So it cost me $15, I'm only making $5 profit per. Uh, I'm not that willing to make a whole lot of shirts if I'm only making $5 per shirt, right? Because even if I sell 100, it's like, well, I sold 100, which isn't gonna be easy, and I only made 500 bucks. That's not very much. So I'm not really motivated to go out and make more because I'm not profiting that much, all right? So let's say at $20, if I'm selling at $20, I, the supplier, I'm willing to make maybe 200 at most, all right? So what I would do is I'd find the two, $20, and I'd connect it with the 200 because this is what I'm willing to make. All right, and I put them together, boom, and then make a dot right there. You with me so far? All right, so $20, I'm willing to make 200. What if I'm able to charge $30 per? Now all of a sudden I'm making $15 a shirt. That's substantially more. Do you think I'm gonna be willing to make more if I'm making more money per shirt? Mm -hmm. Hell yeah, right? So we're just making this up. Let's say at $30. I'm willing to make up to 300, right? I'll, I'll try a little harder to make extra shirts because I'm making more money. In fact, because I make more money back, I can make more anyway. So at $30, let's just say I'm willing to make 300, 300 shirts. So there I go, there's my uh, dots right there. They meet together. You see what I'm doing here? So what am I probably gonna do for the $40? Well, I'm probably willing to or able to make 400, right? Because I got more profits, more incentive. Uh, I'll expand, hire more people, buy more materials and I'll knock it up to 400, right? So that's kind of what goes on here. So you make all those dots all the way up for each price. And that makes sense as a supplier because the more money I'm making, that either motivates me to make more or it gives me more money profit so I can just turn it back into my company, hire more people, uh, open up new facilities, whatever, and make more. So that's why a supply curve is always going to go starting from here up and out because it's always gonna go up together. All right, that's a supply curve. Ooh. I can't even connect dots. I tried to, but I failed. So let's pretend I connected the dots. And that's my supply curve. All right, that basically represents what I would do if these were the prices. All right, so the higher the price, the more willing and able I am to make higher amounts of shirts. That makes sense, right? Because if I'm not making money, I can't make more shirts. Uh, but if I do make a lot of money, I'm gonna try harder because I'm making more money and also I have more money to actually make those shirts. So that's why a supply graph is always gonna look this way. It's always gonna start low, left-hand corner, and it's always gonna go up and to the right, all right? Which law am I looking at right here? Law of supply or law of demand? Law of supply, okay, it's the supply line, of course, law of supply. Why does this show me what the law of supply is? I can just see it on the graph, you know? they're both going up. Do they also both go down? Yeah. Like if I get less money, do I make less? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly right. So you can actually see the law of supply there. All right, now realistically, it's not gonna be a perfectly straight line if you actually get down to it. It, it might actually veer up more or less, but it's gonna roughly look like this. It's gonna be up and out. And you can always tell uh, because the law of supply is present. As the price raises, I'm willing to and able to make more because I'm getting more profit, more incentive. That's what a supply line is always going to look like. So does that make sense? You with me on what a supply line looks like, or supply curve rather? Sweet. So that's what supply looks like. And again, every time I see a supply graph, it'll look that way. I'll have an S. If there's multiple, it'll be like S1, S2. We'll get into that later. But it'll always have an S, and it'll always uh, be looking like it's starting down with the bottom left and going to the upper right. Okay? So that's supply. Well, I'll leave the supply actually. So what's my law of demand say? Price goes up, demand goes down. Okay, cool. So it's the opposite. I'll use, oh, black's not quite moving. Let me get it red here. Demand will be red. All right. Law of demand, right? Law of demand. When price goes up, uh, demand goes down. When price goes down, uh, demand goes up. With supply, it's the same, right? Up price, up supply. Down price down supply. Okay, so what would uh, what do you think demand would look like then as a demand curve? That's a supply curve. That's the way it behaves. So if uh, if it demands the opposite, would it look the opposite? So I just flip direction. it over? Go the, the opposite direction. If I just flipped it over, it looks the same, right? It's just the direction is different. So for demand, it's going to be uh, going basically perpendicular to. Demand will change a lot more, and you guys are gonna find this out when you uh, 
try to find out what your starting price should be for your uh, online businesses. Uh, it won't be a perfect you know, straight line, but it'll have roughly the same uh, behavior or look to it. So if a supply curve goes up like this because both can go up together, a demand curve uh, is gonna get run this way from the top left uh, to the bottom right because it's the opposite, and I'll, and I'll show you why. So if my price my shirt's really expensive at $80, are, are a lot of people likely to buy it? No, no they're not, right? Because it's, it's too expensive. If they can't buy it or they're not willing to or, or whatever. So if we're just hypothetically making this up, you could say, all right, let's say if I sell it for 80, I only have, have about 100 people that are willing to pay that. All right, so then I would, how would I, how would I show that price point? Start where I start? 80. $80. So, and I match with 100, right? Doink. So what if I do it for uh, $70? I lower the price. There's gonna be more or less people that want it. More. more, right. So 70, maybe 200 people want it. All right, so it's, it's double day, look at that. So I would go 70, 200, make my dot, bingo. Same thing with 60. So I lower my price, more people are willing to buy it. So we move one over on quantity, one down in price, doink, and then it goes 60, 300, and, and you kind of see what's going on here. And if I did it all the way down for every single price, Hypothetically, it would be something like uh, this. And that would be the demand. All right, so your demand, it's not always gonna be a straight line. In fact, it normally won't be, but um, it's going to behave about this way, going roughly up here to roughly down here. And it makes sense because you raise the price, less people are willing to buy it or able to buy it. You lower it, more people are willing to are able to buy it. Oh, hey, what about this point right here? They've met. What's that? Equilibrium. That's equilibrium. And that's roughly what you're shooting for because in this, with this, <clears throat> the amount you're making is roughly the same amount that people want. So that's usually a good area uh, to put your price is, is closer to this theoretical equilibrium because that way you're producing about as much as you can and they're buying about as much as they can. And there's not a whole bunch of people pissed off that they can't buy it. Um, so that's why people are generally happier uh, in this area. All right, but we'll, we'll get into what a shortage and a, and a surplus is, but understand this. Demand graph roughly looks that way and it's the opposite because it behaves the opposite, right? You have the opposite incentive. Sellers want to have a higher price so they can make more profit, make more stuff. You as a consumer want a, a lower price because you want to save your money uh, and buy other things too. So the uh, graphs look the opposite, all right? And that's always going to be represented by a D and it's going to behave in some way where it starts up here in the upper left and ends somewhere down here in the bottom right. All right, does that make sense with, it, with this, uh, these graphs so far? Mm -hmm. All right, sweet. Um, you have to be able to interpret these, because again, we'll have them on our own assessments, but if you ever take an SAT or, or an ACT, any sort of intelligence test uh, for a university or whatever, these are likely to be on there, and it's not gonna be my fault you guys don't get into Harvard, because uh, you're gonna know these, all right? So, uh, the way that you're, uh, you can analyze these, obviously equilibrium is in and around the uh, point where the two meet, right? Where you have about the same amount of people want to buy something because you actually have to give them. Uh, it's pretty ideal. But you should know how to identify and even calculate uh, when you have too much or not enough. So this is equilibrium, right? Where they're rough, I should use black for this to signify it's not demand. There we go, equilibrium, where they meet. So again, you want your price to be around there, uh, but <clears throat> you're, always, you're always gonna experience changes because people are either gonna find something else that's just as good or your particular brand might go out of fashion uh, or somebody else devises a new way to uh, uh, make the same product cheaper so they all go to your competitor and you've got to, you're, you're dealing with this issue where people aren't buying your stuff. So there's always gonna be moments, uh, especially when you just start before you kind of figure out what the market wants as far as the price. You're gonna have to be able to figure out what the uh, shortage and the surplus is. So surplus, we'll start with surplus. Surplus is anytime <clears throat> you go to sell something and you don't sell it all. You're just stuck with a bunch left over, all right? Uh, stores have this all the time. I mean, you guys know what sales and clearance sales are, right? Yeah. That's where they just reduce the price because they got too much of something. Like, ah, uh, like if they're selling swimsuits in the summer and they don't all sell, you're gonna see them for like half price or less in the winter because well, they're surplus. They didn't sell them over. They're trying to get rid of them. They know you're probably not going to buy a swimsuit in January because unless you're in the south, uh, uh, southern hemisphere because that's their summer. But if you're up here in the United States, you're not going to buy a bathing suit in January unless you're intentionally doing it to save money. 
but even then it's going to be last year's style. So they reduce the price. <laughs> they're going to reduce the price substantially because of that. All right. So that's what a surplus is. If you ever want to know if you have a surplus or how to calculate it, uh, which you'll have to do for this class at least, is that's going to be any price above equilibrium. All right. So how do I know that any price higher than this marker here at equilibrium is going to leave me, the supplier, with a surplus? Because I can know that by just looking at the uh, uh, chart here. I know you were. That's why I didn't call on you. People don't normally raise their hands like this. So I knew. <clears throat> How would I know that uh, any price higher than equilibrium is going to be a surplus? I can actually tell just from this graph. I could tell you, I guess, but I'd, I'd rather you try to figure it out. People are not going to buy something at a higher price. They don't want to buy it at a lower price. Okay, you're right, but like, based on the graph we made here, how can you tell anything above equilibrium is going to leave me, the supplier, with a surplus? Yeah, exactly. It's the direction of these lines. Okay, so let's let's say I try to sell my shirts at fifty dollars. What's going to happen? Am I going to have uh, not enough to go around, or am I going to have be left with a bunch of shirts uh, that I didn't sell? You'd be left with a bunch of shirts I didn't sell, and I can actually tell by this chart because let's look at it. All right, fifty dollars. That's the price I'm looking at here. All right. So if you're if this is a test or something like that or a quiz, what you'll see is they'll either give you the price, say at $50, or they'll just give you a line at $50 like this. Okay? Um, this, I need another black pen. Black mark. It's gonna die. Sharpie, that won't work. That won't work. Here we go. All right. So here's my line at $50. Okay, I didn't draw it very straight, but whatever. How many people are willing to buy my stuff at $50? I can actually tell exactly how many, at least based on this graph. So, yeah, okay, cool. So I would look, $50, where does this touch the demand graph? So again, the demand represents how much at that price people are willing or able to buy. All right, so at this point, we'll, we'll kind of guess because it's, it's not even exact, but at $50, roughly, I have about 300 people willing to uh, buy my shirts. That's cool, that's great, but um, how many do I actually have to sell at $50? Is it the same as the 300? Roughly 500. Roughly 500, right. So if I wanna see how much I have and or I'm willing to make, or able to make, I would keep going until it touches the supply, right? So at $50, I, the supplier, am willing to make uh, roughly, we'll say this lines up perfectly, uh, roughly 500. Okay, so how many shirts do I have here um, at $50 to sell? 500, right. That's what I'm trying to sell. But they're only willing to buy 300. So can I actually see how many I'm left over with at this price? Yeah. I can, right? I just subtract this number from that number, right? So I got 500 shirts at $50 and people are willing to buy 300, I'm left over with, uh, oops, 200 surplus. And I say surplus because that means extra, ones that I couldn't get rid of. All right, so this is the stuff that I would see on clearance, you know, in January. Like this was a summer t-shirt and I got 200 left over. That's gonna be on my clearance rack or whatever uh, in the fall and January because I'm just trying to get rid of them. All right. so. Any price up here is going to be uh, a surplus because uh, the supply, the amount I have, is going to be higher than the uh, amount people are willing to buy. Let's do one more real quick for, uh, for a surplus. What about at the price of $70? Am I going to have a shortage or a surplus? I'm going to have a surplus. A bigger surplus or a smaller surplus? Bigger. Totally bigger, right. So I would look at 70 right, as the price. And again, if I'm not looking at assessment, I'll probably just have a line right across here so you can see it. And I look, I just go, okay, so at this price, at 70, I, I have roughly 200 people that want to buy it, roughly speaking. And uh, here's the amount I actually am making. I've got 600 available. All right, so what's my surplus going to be? 400, right? I just take the bigger number, 600 minus 200, right? And I got 400 left over. 
and this is at $70 per shirt, and this is at $50 per shirt. All right, so now I'm gonna have 400 left over. I'm gonna try to sell 400 on clearance, um, you know, when fall and winter come around and, and hope I can get rid of them, all right? So that's how I would calculate a uh, surplus. So how would I know if it's a shortage then? If that's surplus. If it's under, they produce. Yeah, anything under is gonna be a uh, shortage. That means I don't have enough to go around. More people want it than I can actually give them. All right, so I'm gonna, in this case, I'd have to raise the price. In this case, I'd have to lower the price, which is why you have a surplus or a, a clearance sale. I didn't sell them all, oh crap. Time to get rid of them, just drop the price to like almost nothing, right? Then they'll probably sell. But if I have the reverse case, so let's say uh, in and out opened up and they're charging $2 for a, uh, uh, just a basic cheeseburger meal. That's insanely cheap. What's gonna happen there? Everyone's gonna go there. They're not gonna have nearly enough uh, uh, fries and burgers to go around, right? So any price that you see that's below equilibrium, you're almost certainly going to have uh, the opposite of a surplus, which is a shortage. And I calculate the exact same way. So let's see what I'd have at $30. So if I start, chose my starting price, and uh, let's say I make it $30, what am I gonna have here? So I draw the line here at 30, or it's on a quiz, I see the line there at 30. Um, how many uh, am I willing to make at $300? Yeah, like 250 in this case, right? You, you kind of have to guess here. So let's say that's 250. All right, that's how many I'm making, because that's how many I can make or I'm willing to make. All right, but how many people want it, my shirt at $30? Yeah, much closer. Well, I wouldn't say 800, it's not 800. It's gonna be wherever the price touches the demand curve, right? So in this case, it's gonna be roughly maybe 550 in this case, right? Oh, sorry, yeah, that is five, it's 550. That's 500, 600, 700. So it is kind of in between the two, I would say. If you had to look at it. All right, just to show you kind of where they meet. Okay, so that's how many people want to or are willing to buy it. That's how many I actually have at that price. So, how would I figure out what my uh, shortage is? How many people are left wanting that can't get it? 300. Yeah, you just subtract, subtract the bigger number from the little number. So 550 people want it, 250 are actually available. That means I'm gonna have a shortage of about 300. So I got 550 people uh, want it, minus the 250 I actually have, equals about a 300 shirt shortage, right, if I'm talking about shirts. All right, what if I lower the price? Is my shortage gonna be higher or lower? Could be a higher shortage, absolutely. Because the further I go down here, the less I'm gonna have and the more people are gonna want. So if I drop it to $20, all right, so there I've got about 200 to sell, but how many people want it at $20? Yeah, like 650 or so, right? And how would I figure out what my shortage is? Subtract this uh, 200 from the 650. So I take my bigger number, 650 minus 200. And that leaves me a 450 shortage. That means 450 people want my shirt and can't get it because I sold out. All right. All right. So I think you guys get that. And also understand what you would do as a supplier. So if this is happening with my shirts, like there's hundreds of people that want it that I can't give it to, what do I have to do? I could make more, but increase the price. Right. So that's going to make less people want it or be able to buy it. Right. Where's it there? and then it'll increase the amount that I actually have available. So that's why you're trying to get around this area, right? You'll almost never be perfectly on it because people are gonna buy different amounts at different times, different prices, but you wanna be close. So that way you're making about the same amount that people are, are uh, desiring. Because otherwise, if you're up here, you're losing money. And if you're down here, people are pissed off and they're just not gonna go back, right? Because they're like, I don't even get anything anyway. I wait in a line for two hours and I don't even get a damn shirt or a cheeseburger or whatever the hell that they want, right? So that's, uh, that's how you would calculate and look for a surplus and a shortage. And we'll practice that throughout the year, but that's basics uh, when we're talking supply and demand on how to read it. And again, on quizzes, it'll either give you a price, it'll say at $30, do you have a shortage or a surplus or equilibrium? And you'll have to look and figure it out. Or they might just say, uh, they might just give you a line and ask you, you know, what it is. Right, so if they just gave you a line, 60, you'd be like, okay, well that's a surplus, then you figure out what the surplus is. Oh, the 600 or so minus the 200 or so, you have about 400 surplus. You guys got that? Sweet.